1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, the last two sessions that we have done in our series on 1 Corinthians 13, we talked about the fact that the gift of tongues, the gift of prophecy, the gift of knowledge are all going to cease. But love will continue on forever. When Christ returns, these gifts that give us partial revelation will stop and the fullness will come. Now, what we're going to do tonight in verses 11 and 12 is we're going to look at some similitudes that Paul uses to help us understand what he talked about in verses 8 through 10. Now, let me tell you what a similitude is. It is kind of a way of likening one thing to another thing in order for us to understand the thing. Okay? So Paul wants us to get the thing tonight. So what he's going to do is he's going to talk about the thing and he's going to liken the thing to something else to help us better understand the thing. It's not really a metaphor. It's something similar as a way of illustration to get the first thing, to get the main thing that Paul wants to get across. Now, I want to say something about likening in the Bible. You know, the Bible does this throughout all of Scripture. All throughout Scripture, um, God's Word will say, I am like this. My Word is like this. All right? And we got to be careful when that happens that we don't stretch the likening too far and we end up saying things that the text isn't really saying. So let me give you an example. The psalmist says, the word, your word, is a lamp unto my feet. Okay? We have to ask ourselves, in what way is the word of God similar to a lamp that you would carry in a dark wooded area to help you see? It is possible to stretch the likening too far. It's possible to stretch it too far and just begin making up stuff. And if you're not careful, you can make up so much stuff that you're off in cuckoo land and you end up being a false teacher. So we want to be very careful when we see the likening in Scripture, to make sure that we do not go too far with it. So I'm going to try to be really careful tonight to pull stuff out, but not make stuff up. You with me? So I want to pull stuff out, but I don't want to make stuff up. And there are six things I want us to see tonight from this text. So let's read 1 Corinthians 13, 11 and 12. When I was a child... I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly but then face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Six things. First, this is all about Jesus coming back. And when he comes back, things are going to be different. Things are going to change. So this text is going to, it's going to tell us some things about now, and it's going to, some, it's going to tell us some things about then. Here's the first thing I want you to know. When Jesus comes back, we don't lose our identity. First thing I want you to see is something called the continuity principle. If you want to take notes, if you're taking notes, write down the continuity principle. Now, this isn't biblical wording. You're not going to be able to go to Scripture and find 
you know, Paul says, now let me talk about the continuity principle. Okay, the phrase continuity principle is not in the Bible. Don't let that bother you. The word Bible is not in the Bible. Okay, so don't freak out that we're using this phrase. The continuity principle basically says this. God is not going to do away with the world and his people, but he's going to resurrect, renew, and transform the world and his people. God is not going to do away with the world and his people. He is going to resurrect, renew, and transform the world and his people. When you got saved, you were changed. We talked about that in our text where it says, anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation that you're a part of because you've been made new. You were changed when you got saved. You were given new hearts, but you were still you. Okay? So when I got saved, I didn't cease to be Neil. You with me? I didn't stop being Neil when I got saved. My personality stayed the same. Now, we want that personality to be reconciled to God. We want that personality to be used now to glorify God. But I stayed the same. So I was changed, but my identity still stayed the same. And, and, and not my identity in Christ, but my identity in who I was. Neil is still Neil. It's still my brain. It's still my, my personality. It's still who I am. And so it will be when Jesus returns. I will still be Neil. I will look like this, however radically changed, glorified, and perfected. When Jesus comes back, People that know you now are going to recognize you because you are going to look like you. Your personality will still be your personality. Okay? You are still going to have the continuity of being yourself. You will still be you. However, radically changed, glorified, and perfected. Look at what Paul says in verse 11. He compares himself to a child that turns into a man. Notice, it's the same person, isn't it? Paul says, when I was a child, and now I'm a man. But guess what? Was Paul still Paul when he was a child? Yes. Still Paul. And that's Paul the child, and now Paul the man. It's the same people. It's not two different people we're talking about. It's not two different people who are talking and thinking and reasoning, but a boy with the same identity that's turning into a man. Before Christ returns, we are children. After he comes back, we will have matured into adulthood. Okay? Paul is saying, right now, in this likening, he is likening our current place as that of children. We only can reason so much. We only can think so much. We only can talk so much when it comes to God. When he comes back, we will have matured into adulthood. But it's still us. You with me? This is the first of Paul's comparison here. He's comparing the here and now to after Christ returns. Number two, what we know now is not wrong. With what I just said, and hopefully you understood what I just said, I want to add this point to it. What we know now and what we are learning now about the Lord is not wrong or erroneous simply because we don't know it all perfectly. So just because you don't know everything there is for you to know about God or you don't know it perfectly doesn't mean that what you're learning now is wrong. He expresses, Paul expresses this again by using the child to man likening. Listen to the way Charles Hodge says it from the 1800s. The feelings and thoughts of a child are true and just insofar as that they are natural impressions of the objects to which they relate. They are neither irrational nor false, but inadequate. When a child... When a five-year-old 
learns 1 plus 1 equals 2. Okay? Just because they don't know calculus doesn't mean 1 plus 1 equals 2 is wrong. You with me? See what I just did? Just because a five or six year old can go k at cat. Just because they, they can barely get that word right, just because they're not reading Shakespeare at five doesn't mean that they've got cat wrong. You with me? So what we know now about God, what we're learning now about God, is it simply, it's not wrong just because we don't know it all, just because we haven't got perfected. As a child, this side of Christ's return, our view of the things of God will be very different from what they will be one day. Once we've matured, we're going to understand more than we do now, but it doesn't mean that what we understand now is wrong. It's just not all the way matured yet. It's just not calculus. It's just not trigonometry. It's just not Shakespeare. It's cat, and it's one plus one equals two. We know this. We know that what we're, we're experiencing now isn't false, just inadequate, because Paul says we know in part. Do you have to know basic math? in order to do algebra? Yeah. You, you've got to have the basics right in order to advance to the next step. Do you have to learn how to, the sound of C and A and T in order to eventually reach Shakespeare? Yes, you do. But you're inadequate if all you can do is read cat, hat, mat, sat. And you never move further than that. When Jesus comes back, he will move us further than that. Right now, we know in part. He's not saying, Paul is not saying, what I know now, what I think now, what I speak now, what I reason now is wrong. It's not what he's saying. He's just saying, I reason in part. I know in part. I speak in part. I don't have the fullness of it all yet. Number three. The mirror teaches us truth. Paul says, verse 12, now we see in a mirror dimly. Now, do you know what they used in Paul's day for a mirror? Huh? Well, they could use water, yes. But let's say they were in the house and they didn't have water. What? They have silver. They would use metal. They would use metal and they would polish metal as good as they could get it. And whatever shiniest material they had, that's what they would use for a mirror. But guess what? They weren't seeing when they looked at themselves. They weren't seeing themselves fully. It wasn't like a mirror we have today where you can spray some Windex on it, clean it off, and you're getting this beautiful reflection. Okay? They were looking at a piece of metal to see their reflection. And every time they did, they would be looking at it dimly. They would be looking at a mirror dimly. They wouldn't be able to see it perfectly. The things that we know of God now are not perfectly seen. God is invisible, cannot be seen with physical eyes. But he has given us things whereby we can see and discover him nonetheless. Paul says those things are a mirror. The things that we can use now to discover God and learn about God, that is a mirror. And there are two ways that we do this, two main ways that we do this, called general and special revelation. Take a notes, write these down. General revelation, special revelation. General revelation is creation. All of creation is a mirror. And when we look at creation, it should tell us some things about God. Okay? It should tell us some things about God. The fact that we have so many different kinds of fish, we were in uh, the Bahamas last week, and we saw so many different types of fish. Just because, Caden uh, kicked a sea urchin, by the way. Still has, are they still in your foot? Have you soaked them out yet? 
Huh? Have you you soak them today? No, of course not. No, just me and uh, Carter and Caden and our their, and their parents. Oh, you weren't invited. Um, we saw all different kinds of fish. Well, you know what? That tells me something about God. God is creative. The fact that God makes a multitude of species of fish, the fact that God has beautiful colors in his creation, the fact that the universe is huge tells me God is huge. So there's things that we can learn just in creation about God. Now, will we see God perfectly by just looking at creation? No. It will be like looking at a mirror dimly. We have God's word. That's what we call special revelation, where God inspires people to write his word. Now, let me ask you this question. Just because we have God's word, does that mean that we will see God perfectly every time we use his word? No. Is it because there's something wrong with the word? No, there's something wrong with me. Why? I'm a child. I reason in part, I think in part, I speak in part, I know in part, even when I'm looking at God's special revelation. You notice that the angels don't need preaching? The angels don't need the Bible? Why? Because they're in the presence of God. The angels are in God's presence. The angels don't need the Bible. They're with God. He does not give them a vision of himself merely in a mirror. He manifests his glory to them. We have not yet reached that height of glory, but it's coming one day. One day, we're going to see differently. Number, what am I on? Number four? Our seeing is indirect seeing. However true it is that our seeing of God is not false and we see it through creation and scripture, Paul says we see it dimly. Let me tell you a minute why things are obscure to us. Why we look at creation and we look at scripture and things are still not perfectly clear. When you look at a beautiful landscape, it can show you the power and beauty of God, but it isn't actually the power and beauty of God. Think, you got to think with me here. If you go to the Grand Canyon, you may look at that Grand Canyon and think, wow, God must be powerful and beautiful. But guess what you're not actually seeing when you look at the Grand Canyon? You're not actually seeing the power and beauty of God. You're seeing something that points to the power and beauty of God. You're not seeing the power and beauty of God. Right? So there's a you're seeing it, but you're seeing it in an obscure way. So you know God is powerful and you know God is beautiful, but you know it dimly. Charles Hodge states it this way. We do not see the things themselves, but things set forth in symbols and words which imperfectly express them. Now hold on to your brains for a minute. When you read the Bible, you are reading symbols put together in such a way that we have taught ourselves that certain symbols make certain sounds and certain sounds put together with other certain sounds mean this thing. Let me give an example. Think of, just think about the lang think about language for a minute, right? The written word. We have decided that a line, just a straight line, 
with a dot on top of it makes a sound. It's, it's, it's two symbols, a line and a dot. We have decided as human beings that a line with a dot on top of it makes a sound. We're going to put a sound to those two symbols. Either I or it. Now, if we take away one of the symbols and we just have a straight line with a, with a line at the bottom coming out, so if we have this, now we're, that's a, those are two different symbols, and we're going to say that says, oh, we're going to call it L. And you put enough of these symbols together in a certain way, we can say light. We have decided that when we look up there, we are seeing light, and we call it light. It's simply a symbol or a word to express the reality of what we're experiencing. And all of that is inadequate. It's all inadequate. I can speak about the beauty of God all day long. And no matter how well I do it, it is inadequate. It still will never get you to experience the beauty of God or to understand the beauty of God as it really is. We're simply trying to navigate... God by using what we have at our disposal. But what we have at our disposal is inadequate. When you read that Jesus rose from the dead, you are not experiencing the reality of that story. You are reading symbols that reveal to you what happened. When you read that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, you are reading symbols and words that do not perfectly express the reality of Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. That cannot be completely understood, understood until you encounter Jesus. Five. Our seeing is limited but growing. So, so follow me with what we're doing. I, as a human being, am going to keep my, my identity is going to be continuous. God has changed me. God is going to change me, but I will always be me. Right now, I experience knowledge and reasoning and understanding in part. Like a child. It's not that I understand. It's not that I'm wrong in my understanding. It means that it, it, it is inadequate. I do not see directly. I see indirectly. And even though my seeing is limited, and even though my seeing is inadequate, it's still growing. Everything here is comparative. Listen to 2 Corinthians 3, 12 through 18. I think you have this in front of you. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites may not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened, for to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed in the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Did Moses reveal God to the people of Israel? Yes. Was it a perfect revelation? No. When Jesus came, did Jesus reveal more than Moses did? Yeah, of course. Of course he did. When Jesus comes back, is he going to reveal more? Of course he will. It's not that what Moses gave wasn't right. This wasn't all of it. Jesus didn't even reveal all of his glory to us. We got to see it 
when we've got to read, we get to read about it on the Mount of Transfiguration when Peter, James, and John saw Jesus transfigured. But we haven't seen Jesus in his full glory yet. Paul is saying the writings of Moses were not perfect comp compared to what is contained in the Gospels. Likewise, what we understand now, even though it is incomplete, it's better than what they had before the Gospels. But we're going to get even more when Jesus comes back. C.S. Lewis states that we live in the Shadowlands. But the shadows are slowly disappearing. And they're giving way to more and more sunlight. I want to say one more thing about 2 Corinthians 2, verse 18. We are being transformed from glory to glory. So here's what that means. That means that even though I'm a child, I'm a growing child. Listen to me. My full maturity in adulthood will come when Jesus comes back. I will not reach spiritual adulthood in this likening he's doing here until Jesus comes back. So I'm still a kid. I understand in part. I reason in part. I think in part. I know in part. But I'm a growing child. Listen to me. The five-year-old says one plus one equals two. When they're 10, are they still a kid? They should be able to do some multiplication and some, some, some division. They don't stay the five-year-old only being able to do one plus one equals two. Two plus two equals four. They're continuing to grow. Same with us. We're not going to be fully matured until Jesus comes back. But does that mean we're not growing in our childhood? No, of course we're growing. We're moving from glory to glory. We're being transformed more and more into the image of Jesus. And just because Paul is saying, but we're like children and the adulthood is coming, doesn't mean that we don't pursue to grow. I want to be, when Jesus comes back or I die, I want to be the most mature child I can possibly be. We are seeing more and we are seeing more, but it will always be obscured. It will always be dimly compared to what will come. And then lastly, when we see, or we will see Jesus as he is. Here's how it ends. Then we will see face to face. Now I know in part then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Now, when he says we're going to know fully, it doesn't mean we're going to know everything there ever is to know. You, you do know that when Jesus comes back, you're not going to know everything there is to know. That would make you omniscient. All-knowing. There's only one person who, who is all-knowing. That's Jesus. You will never know all there is to know. When you have lived on the new earth for 10 years, million years you will still not know all there is to know because you're not God. So it doesn't mean when it says fully known, it doesn't mean that we're going to be omniscient like God. The gap between us and God will still be infinite. Hang on. Hang on to it for two more minutes. However, nothing will be obscured any longer. Because it will be face to face. Everything we know, we will know face to face. That's why it will be better than anything we have ever possibly experienced now as children, no matter how true it is. We will see Jesus directly. All the revelations that are made in Scripture will find their fullness in that moment. What a glorious day it will be when we reach adulthood. When we finally reach the place of spiritual adulthood and we no longer see in part we no longer know in part we no longer speak in part now we can know fully because we are face to face with Jesus I cannot wait for the day 
that nothing hinders my learning more of God. Right now, there's all kinds of things that hinder it. One day, all those hindrances will be gone. And we will learn like we have never learned before. We will speak like we have never spoken before. We will reason like we have never reasoned before. Because we will be in the full presence of God. Which is to say, we will be in the fullness of His love. We have experienced the love of God. You've never experienced it fully yet. That moment when you see Jesus, when you experience God with no hindrances, with no obscuring whatsoever, you are going to experience the love of God like you have never even imagined. It will be face to face.